Hello and welcome to my show. This is uh, Persecuted Church Worldwide. My name is Laurie Ann Smith, and um, I'm just a I'm just a Bible student, not a Bible teacher. But this is a Bible study that I like to do. And just looking at the issues of our brothers and sisters around the world, you know, what is persecution? Why did why does God allow persecution? You know, why is this happening? Why has it been happening since our Lord Jesus Christ ascended, went back and back, went went up to heaven, and um, I don't know a lot about persecution. I never really studied um, early Christian history. And so just a little bit. And uh, that's why I'm doing this show. So hopefully you're getting something out of this and it's um, it's helpful for you. I know for me it is. And um, so, yeah, we'll get right into it. I'm just waking up and uh, having a coffee and everything. Bear with me. <laughs> it's early in the morning. I have to do these shows really early because otherwise I, I don't have time later on. Once my day gets started, um, I don't have time to, to do them. So that's why. It's such an early start. So we'll get right into this. <laughs> um, the lighting in here is horrible. I'm actually working on getting some some better lighting and getting some lamps and stuff. But um, for now, this is just really the best we can do. And we're moving. And so there's boxes all around where you can't see all the way around here. There's boxes. <laughs> uh, we're, we're living sort of out of boxes right now. We've been doing this for a while now because we were going to move. I, I sort of started packing. And, um, and then we didn't move. And... Uh, so that's the result. Um, the, the living room is trashed. And so this is really the best uh, option that I have for, for doing these broadcasts. <laughs> so bear with me. And um, we'll get right into this. I just pray that God would open up our ears and open up our eyes and open up our hearts, open up our spiritual ears, our spiritual eyes, you know, so that we can understand in his word what it is we, he wants us to know and, and what his will is for our lives, you know. And how we can help our brothers and sisters around the world who are suffering for his very namesake. You know, for his glory. They're suffering, they're dying for his name, the name of Jesus Christ. And no other reason. I mean, it's not that it's just that they live in a, in a in an area of the world that's, that there's, you know, issues and problems. It's just for the very namesake that they're of Jesus Christ, that those people are suffering, they're dying. They're, they're, if, they're, if that's not happening, they're... They're being fired or, or let go from their jobs because they're they're Christians, you know, and or maybe um, you know loss of uh, property, things like this, right? So I just pray, you know, that God would first of all open up our eyes and ears and open up open up a way that we can help our brothers and sisters around the world, and also that you know that we would pray for them and we would keep them in our prayers and and, and that God would bolster them and strengthen them for what they must endure, and that He would. He would cause them to know and understand that that yeah there is suffering on this earth and they are and they will suffer for the name of, of Jesus, but it's such a short time compared to the to the rewards and the glory that they're going to receive in God's kingdom, in God's in in heaven. You know when they get there for suffering for the name of Jesus Christ, there, there's rewards for this and they're going to be eternally rewarded. Um, and that's a long time, eternity. So, Lord, I just pray that you would just show us, you know, in our hearts and in our minds. Give us a glimpse of that eternal, that eternal, precious gift that you have given us by and through and because of your precious son, Lord Jesus Christ, going to the cross and, and dying for our sin, the sin of the world, the sin of mankind, so that we could all, anybody who in whosoever would be saved, could come to the foot of the cross and be reborn and renewed and recreated and that we would know that this life is short and there is suffering god has it all worked out for his purposes and his plans but father show us show us give us comfort and and help in your precious holy spirit to to give us the, the strength to endure and to know that it's going to be so much so much better when we're with you and i pray this in the name of the lord jesus christ amen so we'll get right into this. Um, we were looking at uh, um, information from Voice of the Martyrs Canada, VOM uh, Canada. And they said, you know, anybody can use this information. It's not a problem. You just can't make money on it. And uh, it's not to be sold for profit. So uh, they have a great, well, they did have a great bunch of information on their website, but they took it down because they're redoing it. It's actually a little small persecution studies. It's the only one I've ever seen. And um, really great, 
um, set of info as well as videos and stuff from uh, Glenn Penner, who did some great work on persecution in the, the, the church, right? So hopefully when they put that back, back up there, you can go there. It's, it's Voice of the Martyr of Canada. So this is where this information is coming from. It's not my information. And we were looking at last video. You can go back and watch that if you want to catch what we were talking about. How do we respond if we're persecuted? So this is, um, this is how, how is our response? What, is, what are we supposed to do in response to, to the fact you know, that we might be persecuted for our faith, the very namesake of Jesus Christ? Right? And so they were saying, you know, responding to persecution uh, negatively, how we're not supposed to respond. We looked at uh, com corrupting the word, uh, retaliation. Next up that we're looking at today is uh, fleeing to avoid pain or, or imprisonment. So that's what we're not to do. We're not to flee to avoid pain or imprisonment. And, and uh, it says, it says uh, the word of God does not give believers license to flee from persecution, simply to make life easier or to avoid suffering. It says fear of sharing one's faith or of identifying with the persecuted. So we're not to, we're not to fear sharing our faith or identifying ourselves as being in Christ you know, um, with the persecuted. And they reference uh, 2 Timothy 1.8, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Amen. Yeah, who hath called us and, and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I love the Apostle Paul's writings. And, um, you know, this is just it. You know, it would be so tempting to, it really would be, to, if I, if I, if it was just me and I try to, I, I, you know, I think about trying to put myself in these uh, brothers and sisters, you know, shoes around the world who are being persecuted for their, for the faith. And, you know, I think it would just be so easy to, yeah, and it would be tempting to just want to run, to want to flee. I mean, you think about the Iraqi Christians, you know, the Christians in Iraq who who have been underground for a long time because they'll, they'll be killed, they'll be murdered. And they, they have been, and they, all, they really almost have been annihilated, actually, out of that part of the world. Um, look at the church in China. It's all underground, but it's, it's, I guess, according to statistics, it's the world's largest church in China. The world's largest church, hidden underground. You know, it's, uh, these things are very, very difficult. I know if it was just me and I didn't have any children to worry about, you know, and, and I, I could picture somebody like, like, you know, a grown man or a grown woman just on their own, it wouldn't be so hard to stand and, and be persecuted for your faith, right? But if you have little children involved, I think that would change things for you. <laughs> that would definitely change your outlook and your and your mind. <laughs> it would be hard to know that you know if you stayed that your children could be slaughtered, and probably will be, you know, for the faith of, of Jesus Christ. Hopefully, I'm streaming properly here. I've got a kind of a connection problem uh, sometimes, so hopefully, I'm still streaming <laughs> and everything's all right there. Um, but yeah, this is a, this is absolutely horrific, you know, to think about this and. You know, for somebody, yeah, somebody who is uh, single, perhaps, an older adult, it wouldn't be such a hard situation, I don't think, to allow ourselves to be persecuted. But when you know that your children are probably going to be either sold off as sex sex slaves or uh, or murdered, just, you know, outright murdered because of, of the faith that the family has in Jesus Christ, it would be so tempting to want to run from that, right? And want to hide instead of proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ. So you know there's a huge reward for those those brothers and sisters from years, so many years ago, 2,000 years ago, who didn't run and didn't hide, didn't try to keep their lives, and actually died and paid the price for the very namesake of Jesus Christ. And said, no, no, for me to die is gain. You know, and that message then got out to us. Had they all run, had the early church all run and hidden, um, this message wouldn't have, wouldn't have come out like it did, and it wouldn't mean much to the gap to the to the to the persecutors, because when they see, you know, oh yeah, they just run when we come, 
like little cockroaches going underground and stuff, then the faith doesn't mean anything to them. But when people stand and say, no, I willingly give my life, and uh, you can you can take it because um, I serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And I'll pray for you. you know? And they forgive their, their persecutors. They forgive their captors, whatever. And uh, they just allow themselves to go down in, in the in the books, that's God's book, which is the only important book ever, and uh, his book of life, you know, as, yeah, here on the earth, martyrs, which people, a lot of people don't appreciate and don't like, and they think, oh, they're just a martyr, you know, you know, just thinking it's quite silly to give your life for the Lord Jesus Christ, right? But they're going to they're gonna go on to eternal rewards in heaven that we have no idea what they are. Eternally rewarded by God. Hallelujah. And so, you know, that's, to me, that's uh, that's amazing. Because I don't know what I would do in, in their shoes, especially if I had children, right? I've never been put in that position, you know? So really, uh, certain interesting things to think about here, very important things that most people in the church don't even want to think about and wouldn't want to spend too much time talking about, that's for sure. So apostasy is another thing. We're not to be, you know, to, to become uh, apostatized, right? Renouncing Christianity, returning to one's previous religious beliefs, um, exemplified by pulling away from God's people. So, you know, this is a big, this, if you look back at church history, I mean, apostatized, uh, I mean, especially the early church, <laughs> the church, the church at Rome, the, the, the Catholics, um, and I mean, no, there's just about everybody's been guilty of something like this, but the Catholics were also guilty of something like this and uh, killed a lot of people, a lot of Christians, you know, because they wouldn't, they wouldn't come over to what they believed exactly. So that's always a big problem in you know, getting them to renounce their, uh, whatever they were doing. But this is talking about renoun renouncing Christianity and, and I, this would be to renounce Jesus is what they're talking about here. And, you know... Uh, throughout history, people have been made, you know, to, to either die or renounce Jesus, right? And uh, would I do that? I've thought about it, you know, and I think about it and I'm like, no. If somebody comes, you know, and takes over this country and they threaten to cut my head off if I don't renounce Jesus, I'm just going to tell them, I'll forgive you. But I, I can't renounce my Lord. You know, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. And I hope he's yours too, yours too and I'll pray for you. And, you know, I forgive you. And I just... You know, I'm not renouncing Jesus' name. I don't I don't care what the circumstances are. They can torture me, like I said in my last video. I don't care. I've been tortured as a, ch as a child anyway. So I can, you know, whatever I can take and whatever my body can't take, that's that's the way it's going to go because I'm not ever renouncing the name of Jesus Christ. He never let me down. So, therefore, I will never renounce him. And so it's, uh, it's hard, though, because you think about these tortures that these people went through. Um, horrible, horrible stuff, which, I mean, we're not covering on this particular show. Down the road, we might take a look at some of that. But right now, we're just looking at what we're not to do. We're not to flee to avoid pain or imprisonment, which would be very tempting. Uh, fear of sharing one's faith or, or of identifying with the persecuted, right? Apostasy, apostatizing, right? Um, those are things that we're not to do, right? So now we're going to look at positively um, uh, what we're allowed to do or what the proper response would be. And they said here, biblically, there seems to be three basic responses that the Lord allows when his people are persecuted. Uh, flight, it says, there is a biblical permission to flee from persecution. The motive behind fleeing, however, is, is what is critical. If it were primarily to avoid suffering, then this would not be a sufficient reason. Throughout the New Testament, the priority is always on the mission of the kingdom of God above all else. So family possessions, personal safety, to name a few. So... If it's just to avoid suffering, then I guess that's not a good enough reason, really, they're saying here. Because Jesus suffered. The apostles suffered. The early church suffered. And that's, I think, what the, the point that they're trying to make. They reference uh, Matthew 10, 23. And, um, but when they persecute you, this is Jesus. And, uh, but when they persecute you in the city... Flee ye unto another, for verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. Acts 8, 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. 
and uh, they reference Second Corinthians 11, 33 In Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the king kept the city of, of Damascus with a garrison desirous to apprehend me. And through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. So this is Paul's, you know, Paul's story of escaping, getting out of Damascus. Yeah, Paul, you know, but he didn't, he didn't, uh, he escaped for the mission of the kingdom of God, basically. So this is, this is the examples really in the word of God where, you know, this is, this is what was necessary. But you know, at the time when uh, Paul was arrested there at the end, when, and just before he was beheaded, you know, he probably could have got away. But he went right into the thick of where he knew he was told not to go, and went, kept going back and kept going back and kept going back. Um, he could have ran and gone somewhere else, you know, but he, I believe that he was led to do that. And when he was, you know, captured again and then threatened with, uh, you know, with if he didn't stop, you know, doing what he was doing, they were going to kill him. And he just went and he was, he just still basically allowed himself to be beheaded. But, you know, and to me, I mean, it's just, you know, these, this is uh, kind of the, the heavy stuff in the Bible, you know. So we can see that there was so much suffering and the people died and these people willingly gave their lives, like we were talking about in the last video, if you want to look at if you want to go watch that. So they said, if the mission were, however, threatened by persecution, withdrawal was permitted. Missionary commission must take priority over both personal comfort and the motif of suffering. So if it was just about personal suffering, uh, I don't think we're really allowed, to, you know, we're not supposed to be fleeing an area or fleeing the situation. But if it's for, um, if, if, if the mission is threatened by persecution, Withdrawal was permitted, so it's kind of interesting. Withdrawal to another city in order that the gospel may continue to spread. And uh, we just read those um, scriptures, Matthew 23.10 and Acts 8.1. And, uh, and in Corinthians, they said that Paul refers to this fleeing as part of his catalog of suffering for Christ. The flight was not, therefore, a flight from suffering, but a flight in order to fulfill the mission of Christ. And so while God's word can go out forcefully through the testimony of martyrdom, it is sometimes better that people remain alive in order to proclaim it. So, yeah, this is right. The example of Jesus, while there were times that Jesus hid himself, this hiding was because this time had, his time had not yet come. So his escape from suffering and death, however, was only a postponement. So his mission must be preserved, a mission that culminates in his suffering and death. So, yeah, Jesus, I mean, he did, he would just withdraw or move, move on to another another situation because he needed to fulfill his mission. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Praise God. Oh, so thankful. It says, nevertheless, Jesus did not pull away from confrontations from the religious leaders of his day. No tactical moves, no compromise, no watering down of his message, no avoidance of suffering. He's not a hireling who flees in the time of peril, but a good shepherd who, whose main concern is not his own safety, but the safety of others and who lays down his life for his flock. This is expected of his followers as well. All timidity and denial in the face of suffering is contrary to the confession of faith in Christ. Uh, to stand and confess not only in the limelight, but in the apparently unimportant moments. Yeah, that's right. On the elevator, talking to somebody. You know? Um, just sitting on a park bench talking to somebody. It's not, not necessarily these major situations where if one might be in the limelight to stand and confess. That's almost, it's really easier to do to a, to a group. It's easy for me to come on these, uh, do these broadcasts here and say, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. And because I'm just sitting in my living room and I'm, you know, hoping that others out here will get something out of these videos, but it's easy for me to confess that here. Is it easy for me to confess that in, in a hostile situation or perhaps, or, or in a situation where I'm not quite that comfortable, not sure how many Christians are there around, might be in a whole ha group of people that are um, re religiously diverse, you know. Am I still going to stand and confess, you know, Jesus is my Lord and Savior? It's a little more difficult. That's actually more important. It's the more important witness. It's the more important testimony. So, Flight is therefore forbidden where obedience to God's commandments and Christ's commission and love for others would be jeopardized. 
So they said here, the avoidance of distress and pain is not the supreme good. Suffering is not the worst thing that can happen to us. Disobedience to God is. Actually, I mean, then that's hard for a lot of people to get their heads around. And suffering is not the worst thing that can happen to us. Disobedience to God is. If a person's without God in their life, then suffering is the worst thing that can happen to you. Nobody wants to suffer. It's horrible. And it's not just suffering um, in, a, in a physical way. In a phys you know, suffering... Uh, anguish, you know, emotionally, suffering, you know, in uh, in lacking in in uh, in food or in shelter or you know whatever, you know, like people are suffering around the world right now, you know, in droughts and uh, famines and whatnot, and also there's people suffering, you know, being being bombed, right? all kinds of horrible stuff going on, but they're not necessarily suffering for the for the for the name, very namesake of Jesus Christ and their faith, right? So, so of course, suffering is horrible. But the thing is, is what they're talking about here is, is when we're in Christ and we are born again and we're, we are, we have this glorious, glorious redemption. Hallelujah. You know, um, suffering is not the worst thing that can happen. That could happen is disobedience to God, because the other people out there in the world they need a savior, and sadly enough, you know. Hopefully they, they'll, they'll get the opportunity to be saved and to be brought back into right standing with God, our Father, our Creator, our Maker, you know. But for me, you know, I've been born again, so the worst thing I can do, actually the very worst thing I can do is just be disobedient to God. Yeah, I could confess my sin and, and pray that he, for, you know, that he forgives me because it's been forgiven at the cross, you know, as long as I confess it and and repent. and But the issue is, is, it's worse, far worse to disobey God than it is to suffer in this situation as far as being a born-again Christian. Because sin separates us from God, you know. Disobedience is, is a real problem. God already knows our frame, you know. He knows what we're made of. He knows the, the situation in our lives. And I think that's what a lot of people don't think about. A lot of people think of God as if he's, you know, he's this creator, creator God who just created the whole thing and now he's off somewhere else and he's not paying attention and he's not around and he's not he doesn't care about the day-to-day -day of somebody getting their head bashed in or somebody getting their face bashed in or somebody just being beaten half to death you know that he doesn't care because he's not there to stop it anyway and so he must not be around he just created the whole thing and he's off gallivanting around the universe somewhere having or outside of the universe just having a good time and then at one point you know we'll come and do all this stuff right i think a lot of people feel that way and it's not true because he, every single, he's already seen the end from the beginning. He saw what I was going to do. He saw what I've done. I haven't even seen what I've done because I haven't done it yet. It's in the future. He's seen the whole entire thing. He's also in, in control of the whole entire thing. He's given man a free will, free choice, but he knows already what I've done. So I sit here and I say, Lord, I just want to be a faithful, true, faithful servant to you, <laughs> which I know that I'm going to mess up, Right. In my fallen state, in this fallen world, even though I've been born again, renewed, recreated, I'm born again. I can't be Jesus. And no one can be Jesus. Jesus is Jesus. Jesus Christ is Jesus, the Son of God. He's perfect, right? We're not. And he knows our frame, and he knows our suffering. He knows our trials, because he came in the flesh to be as we. And he came so that he could he could be our faithful high priest, knowing that we're, knowing what's going on with being in this flesh suit and in this earth created body that God actually originally created with Adam and Eve, right? So he knows our frame and he knows our situation. And so I believe that God only gives them, I've heard this before and I never used to like it because I grew up abused, that God just gives us what we can handle. You know, and um uh, Really, now that I'm a born-again Christian, I can see that that's absolutely true. That God is, he is expecting that as a born-again Christian, I'm going, to, I'm going to call upon him for strength in the suffering. I'm not going to pray against the suffering he's brought into my life. There's a reason for it. And this is so hard for so many people to wrap their head around. Because suffering to us outside of, of the plan of God seems like, such a horrible thing, because it is outside the plan of God. <clears throat> outside the plan of God, suffering is just the devil doing the devil's work. This I know, because I grew up abused. Right? 
So, but suffering in the plan of God, if God brings the suffering, because I'm born again, and now because uh, for my testimony and my faith, if that causes some suffering in my life, I'm not to run from it. I'm to actually embrace it and ask and pray that God would help me to endure it. And so I could be a faithful witness for his gospel, for his glory. Hallelujah, to get this message out, you know. So I think that's very interesting. They said, uh, careful consideration must be given when persecution arises, whether or not suffering is necessary in order to accomplish the will of God. So yes, we don't want to go out. You know, there were martyrs in the beginning there, uh, way, way back 2,000 years ago, who were, um, you know, they'd go out and they'd sit on a pole in the middle of the desert, you know, and just live the rest of their lives on a pole in the desert with, you know, very minimal, like, no shelter, no food, no water, and they wouldn't survive. But they, God, it, it, did God call them to do that? You know? Do it. So, yeah, it's not it's not for me to go out and just just intentionally just cause myself harm and damage for the for the cause of Christ. Because if it's not God's will, it's you just that's just a actually that's just not going to help anything, you know? So they, I like what they said here. Careful consideration must be given when persecution arises, whether or not suffering is necessary in order to accomplish the will of God. So what I pray, you know, this is, we've got about two minutes here. I just pray that God would just strengthen us, you know, and all the brothers and sisters around the world right now who are suffering for the very namesake of Jesus Christ. Strengthen us to understand that there's his plan and purpose, you know, does include suffering. And if it's his will that we suffer, that he would cause strength to come over us and that we as the body of Christ here in North America and where I live in Canada would come together in unity and pray and and really intercession intercessory prayer for our brothers and sisters around the world who are being persecuted right now in Jesus name I pray amen yeah this is uh you can get information you know if you go to Voice of the Martyrs Canada there's a lot of different websites out there there's a uh, um, there's uh, I Commit to Pray. There's also um, the Inter ICC International Christian Concern. There's a lot of great websites that will bring all kinds of info for you about the persecuted church and just what's going on around the world right now. Um, I get these e emails in my inbox all the time from these different places, and uh, which is great because then I can pray for them, you know, right, you know, real time sort of thing, and. We do need to pray for them, you know, because most of the world either just doesn't care, or they're just um, they're uh, neutral, you know. They're not they don't care about these people that are suffering for the name of Jesus. They probably think that they're silly. Um, then the church, the body of Christ in North America, just wants to shove them under the carpet, just like abuse and sexual abuse and child sexual abuse, and they just shove it under the carpet. We don't want to hear about it. If it doesn't have to do with blessing and Woohoo, the Lord's blessed me with a new car, $5,000, I got a $5,000 check, you know, and just all thinking about their bank accounts, their bank books, how many vehicles they got from the Lord, and their new house that they're buying. That's not Christianity, man. I'm sorry. It's not. So, um, you know, it's a huge issue over here. It's a real problem. The gospel's been tainted, false teaching come in. And there's a lot of people following it because it sounds really good. It's from the devil. It sounds real good. So you know it's going to be from the evil one, right? He's coming to be like Christ. That's why he's called the Antichrist. He's not coming with these with these horns, you know, and this red tail as a dragon. He is the dragon. He's a serpent. He's evil. The issue is, is that uh, he's coming to be like Christ. He's going to win the people over, you bet. And it'll be the church that's won over. It usually is. So we got to be very wary of that. You know, the wolf in sheep's clothing. You know, the church doesn't care that the brothers and sisters are, are suffering around the world. Most people don't. They don't care. No. They don't care that people are suffering in the pew next to them. Being abused, domestic violence, sexual abuse, you name it. They don't care. Because it's all about when they, what they're going to do after church. i got to go wash my car and i got to go buy all this stuff. and i got to deposit that $10,000 check that came in. I'm so blessed. Woohoo! You know? So... Do the right thing, you know. <laughs> get into the God. Get into the Word of God. Get off of the TV programs that are out there preaching that false message. Get into the Word of God and start learning it. Right? That's what I'm doing. God bless you all. Till the next time. We'll talk to you soon.